All right, so uh, we should be live and uh, welcome. That's I don't even know how to see who's here, but uh, you guys can pop notes in the comments from either place, YouTube or Facebook, if you like. We'll be having Q&A later and those kind of things. Um, of course, where you are here, first of all, today, first of all, mainly, really, to celebrate the release of Ken Schneer's collection anthems outside time and other strange voices. And so uh, thank you for coming up, popping in and uh, showing your support of Ken and his book. And his book looks like this. And let's see, I got my guys waiting in the wings here. Where are they? I got to stop my screen. There they are. Oh, they are cranking open some champagne or something. Okay. Champagne. Liz, you got your mic on now. You got your mic on. What the heck? I got. I don't have champagne on my end, but I got a little something nice right here too. Oh wait, I should have waited for Liz. Liz, we got the toast. A virtual toast. <laughs> While she's getting ready, <laughs> you can see the whole thing. You know, what? I I can't. I got to do this because you know we got to see a little more of Liz shooting for <laughs> that <laughs> that domination there of the uh, champagne one of them's going to win uh, <laughs> so uh just uh while this is getting going here uh ken's book of course his official release date was tuesday and uh there were a number of uh, fancy readings going on that day, and we said, let's let's think of another day. Wednesday, well, okay, KGB and other readings. Okay, Thursday, that looks good. And, of course, a few others popped in later anyway, so we, uh, we're we going to do it, and we hope that you'll, uh, you'll come in and uh, join us in the uh, experience. Um, you can uh, – oh, I also wanted to mention that Ken's – essay um, is, went up today on John Scalzi's whatever site, which is uh, wonderfully astute, of course, uh, essay about the big idea beyond his, behind his book. So you get a chance to check out that, uh, that blog posting today, do so. Um, we've had uh, our fair share of, hi, Nikki. She's watching this from the river. <laughs> Don't drown, Nikki. Don't do any surfing there in that river. Um, no, that's the wrong one, huh? You have to be in Missoula for that. But uh, yeah, we had uh, we last, you know, some Amazon Kindle with issues, which is back up today, by the way. So there's some print issues. It's all COVID related, um, snafu related. Maybe some on my part. I don't know, but it's kind of the new norm. So right now, the website, my website, is uh, kind of the only place that uh, you can order a print copy right now. And uh, if you wanted to do that, it is going to look like this. If I get the screen here, that's Liz, the uh, official, that's the official that Fairwood website. Yes, it is. Liz, your mic needs to be on. And uh, this is his website here, uh, or my website with uh, the Schneier look. There's also links to uh, all the various ebook dealers. Ebooks live and aware in all kinds of places. There's a release notice and uh, some pretty good reviews as you can see there. So um, that's a great place you can go and get it sooner than later because we don't know what's gonna go on with our online venues and partners um, 
until then. But we are okay. Um, yay. Hi, Janice. Um, so let's see. I wanted to briefly go over our schedule. Woman versus court. Have you got that open yet? Can we toast yet, Liz? Um, right now, I think it's at a, at a hazardous <laughs> level. Okay. Well, let's keep working on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so after this, I am look. going to I'm going to uh, turn the show over to Liz and Ken, um, and uh, they're going to do the the main bulk of the work here. And I'm just going to wait in the wings and off screen and watch the chat. And there will be Q and A later. And so Ken will then read a story, read a little bit, and then there'll be an interview with uh, Liz and some time for Q and A and probably another reading short reading and if there's more time for questions at the end we'll do that i should yes, I sh yeah i should mention something um we uh tend to see uh, your your comments um uh anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds after you make them so there's going to be a significant delay uh in between your commenting and our and our responding to them okay good i was i hadn't noticed when those popped in yeah uh, they were like five of uh mm -hmm. Janice's that came in all at once mm -hmm. <laughs> on my screen does that happen on yours too uh yes um so janice is on youtube nikki's uh watching from facebook um and people are just looking too so um okay that's our schedule and you got it are you ready liz i am ready drink? all right a toast a toast <laughs> to ken toast. I know toast. Well, if toast you're toasting me, I can't drink. Toast the book. <laughs> okay, toast the book. Toast, toast the book. Anthem's outside time. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Hi, Shauna. Right. There'll be uh, <laughs> there'll be more drinking later. Or during. <laughs> I'm on screen. You don't know what I'm doing. So I got my kid <laughs> off of his Wi-Fi, off of his computer, off of his phone. He's reading. Um, just make sure my bandwidth. Stay Hi, Ali. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to go and talk Hi, a little bit about my guests here. Yay. So interviewing Ken today um, will be Liz Argall and, of course, um, Kenneth. Doesn't go by, by Kenneth normally, except for your writing name, right? Ken, for those who know him. Ken Schneier. I say that right, right? Yes. Because, you know, we're mostly in electrons when we've been talking over the past. That's right year and a half, whatever it's been. Had three um, different uh, three different podcast uh, narrators uh, pronounce the name wrong. Oh, boy. That's not good. <laughs> um, I am trying to move three screens here. Um, so let me first talk about our guest of honor, Ken Schneier, who's been at one time or another an actor. You'll have to tell you about that sometime. A corporate lawyer, a dishwasher, a research assistant, humanities professor, clerk, typist, IT project manager, assistant dean of a technology school, Bronk writer. No, I'm just kidding. I added that one. Um, he received nominations in 2014 for a Nebula and Sturgeon for his story, selected program notes from the retrospective exhibition of Teresa Rosenberg. Vladimir, <gasps> Woo. conveniently in the collection, by the way, everybody. His work appears in such venues as Lightspeed, Uncanny, Analog, Strange Horizons, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Daily Science Fiction, The Clockwork Phoenix Anthologies, and podcasts such as Escape Pod, Podcastle, Pseudopod, and The Drabblecast, and has been translated into Italian, Russian, Czech, and Chinese, and Pig Latin. No, no, not the Pig Latin. Um, you got some other stuff too, right? The uh, articles on constitutive rhetoric with legal texts, which that just blows my mind just saying that. Uh, you live in Rhode Island with his wife and two tabby cats and grown children occasionally when they pop back in. And uh, Anthem's Outside Time and Other Strange Voices is his second published collection. And the first was, Liz, didn't you write the intro to Ken's first one? I did indeed. Yes, okay, I thought so. Um, and, um, for uh, he's interviewed by the, oh, by the way, um, and Ken is a, an alum of the Clarion class of 2009, right? I am. You guys, can you guys see my, oops, I'm, I'm mirrored right here on the yeah. back behind me is my Clarion West poster. Ah, uh, 
from 1986 old school so but anyway clarions we all unite regardless and uh and strangely liz argall was also in the class of 2009 hence now you know strangely she co-wrote one of the stories in this collection and strangely she wrote <laughs> yes that was the one that was that was on in uncanny right yes on uncanny. Right. yes um where are so liz my goodness so you're an author a cartoonist a workshop facilitator um speech writer public speaker um anything else that i'm missing on that there's a lot there you shenanigans have, <laughs> yes <laughs> shenanigans uh have fictions appeared in uncanny apex magazine podcastle strange horizons daily science fiction and tons of others um, as a cartoonist, you've been a script writer and she's all over. I was looking at her list credits and I'm going boggle. So, um, and also 2009 with Ken. And I believe you guys also, uh, had like three of you guys all rooming together in the, uh, mm -hmm. the dorm or wherever they have it over there yes. at Clarion, uh, in California. Is Matt London watching? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yes. Matt, say hi. Sarah, hello. Uh, Allie, hello. Shauna, we already said hello. Hello again. Dorothy, hello. Um, hi, Dorothy. All right. You guys know these guys. Um, okay. So at this point, I believe, Liz, you ready to take over? I, I am. All right. So I'm going to like pop out of here. Um, I can pop in at a moment's notice. But when I'm out of here, I'm going to be uh, um, mic free. So. Uh, here we go, and I'm going to put you guys face to face as close as I can uh, for this scintillating interview. Yes, Liz. <laughs> we'll pop. Um, yeah. Hi, so Liz. Hello. Hang on a um, second. A well, quick second. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, Ken and I did Clarion in the class of 2009 in San Diego. Um, so Ken has seen me at some of my most extremely sleep surprised. <laughs> and vice and, versa. <laughs> certainly. Back. But it was, a, I think, a leveling up experience for both of us. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we were not short of uh, strong opinions in our class. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of good, robust debates. Um, and... Uh, uh, it's been, it's been Liz, your voice is cutting in and out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. How is that? Is that? that, 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 that yeah, it's. Uh, it's cutting in and out. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it was. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, it's, it's so exciting to be here on the launch of your book. I've, I'm, I'm going, I've completely. <laughs> I completely love the plot with joy um, and going and looking at, at, at all the different um, those who are six week internship. Um, and one of the amazing things you get out of it is a bunch of really determined people who uh, love to write and share, uh, share their opinions and stuff like that. Um, before we get into what do you think was so Liz, I'm sorry, you're we're losing large chunks of it. I wonder if you want to try using your um, your computer mic instead of your headset. If you want to dis disconnect the headset and just go live on the on the computer mic, it might be the connection between the two. How's that? Is That's that great. Cool? Okay, oh. I'm sorry about that. Fancy high technology. At least the hair's not looking too weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, Clarion would would have been going on right now. Um, in and, yeah. Uh, so it's it's a fun time to reminisce. What was like the biggest level up experience thing you got from Clarion? Oh my god, um, there were so many lessons, you know, um, and I I I, I think. So here's the thing, right? I mean, you, you remember that what you spend most of your time doing at Clarion is not writing, but critiquing, 
Right. So, I mean, you write one story a week if you're lucky, um, but you critique 17 stories a week. And so you, you really develop an eye for things that um, work and don't work. Uh, dialogue and characterization and pacing and so forth. And I remember very clearly, um, right after I got back from Clarion, I uh, took a story that I had in draft form that I may already have submitted somewhere. I can't remember, but I wanted to show it to you guys. And so I gave it the once, the once over before uh, sending it off to you guys. And I was appalled, right? I mean, there were like a gazillion things wrong with it that I could see that I couldn't see before Clarion. So I think it makes you a better reviser because it makes you a better spotter of things that are problems. That was that was the biggest level up for me. How about you? Yeah, I, when I came home, one of the things my husband said to me when I came home was like, you've changed. You yeah. Um, your opinions are clearer now. You not only have an opinion, but you like can really um, concisely um, like articulate why you have the opinion and and you know what going through that level of sort of dissection and having to find words for really really complicated feelings sometimes. Yeah. Right? You read a story and you've got a gut instinct and you're like, I don't. How do I put this in words? How yeah. do I? Um, but having but having done it, you know, uh, eighty or ninety times, um, in a very short time period. Yeah, you guys are the best at spotting when I flinch or sat on something. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that was one of us would write, and I'd taken that habit. I would she would underline it and go flinch. Um, what did you what did you dodge here? <laughs> what truth of the text are you ignoring? <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so uh, um, I really love oh go ahead. <laughs> I really love your um in terms of that ability to revise. I think one of the things that comes through in a lot of the um the 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 outros to all your stories, which I love in terms of a as a process wonk. Um, you have such a dedication to returning to stories um, that uh, that um you know aren't quite there, and you know like your your doggedness at going back to stories. Where did that come from? Do you think? <laughs> Uh, going back, you mean for rev revising? You yeah, revising, or? and you know, like I had this idea ten years ago, and now I oh, well, it it's, didn't work. And it's less doggedness than than the fact that things just never get finished. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll write a I'll write a scene, and um, I'll write a scene, and I'll done or not know what to do with it next. I mean, I, I don't. I usually, so uh, for those who don't know a lot about the writing process, uh, in slang terms, writers are sometimes divided into those who are called plotters and pantsers. Um, by plotters, we mean uh, people, um, you know, who know in advance everything that's going to be in the story and pantsers who write by the seat of their pants, right? And I'm much more of a pantser than I'm a plotter. And so I'll literally write, you know, three or four scenes that I love and have n absolutely no idea what to do with them. So I'll put them in this file drawer, you know, or I'll put them in a computer file and I'll leave them there and I'll work on something else. And then I'll put that in a bin. Eventually I'll come back to it and I'll say, I wonder if I have any new ideas about this now. And I'll, then maybe one will come. And so it can take me years and years and years to finish a story, um, not because I'm a perfectionist and trying to revise, but because I literally don't have the story until, yeah. You know, and then multiple revisions. So, you know, one of the stories in here, um, the lineage, I think, uh, was in three utterly different versions. It was, I mean, unrecognizable from draft to draft to draft. Another one, um, it's called uh, Circus and Sleep. Um, I think I had three 
different writing groups look at it at three different times. Um, and every one had different suggestions and it made huge changes each time. Uh, and that one also, the editor um, had huge suggestions and I made big changes then uh, as well. So it just, it just takes me a long time to uh, get stuff finished. Yeah, I remember, I remember having big opinions about circus. <laughs> Because it was so beautiful and that I didn't like what some bits that you did. Right. I actually had a lot of emotion. I remember actually your first comment on that story. <laughs> oh, what was it? I don't it, remember. It was, well, I'm really glad this didn't turn it to be a story, but how grand it is to die for your city. Right. Because I'm sick of stories like that. <laughs> Sounds like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, one of the lovely things about Clarion and getting the reps in with each other is uh, I'm a pretty blunt critiquer. Um, and with uh, when you've shared six weeks in this really intensive boot camp with experts coming through and you're pulling your bits of your heart out, mm -hmm. um, uh, you can be pretty robust with each other. <laughs> yeah, indeed we indeed we can. Um, so. So, so anyway, this has been a really this uh, creating this um, this uh, collection with Patrick has been just this marvelous uh, experience. It took for over a very long period. I mean, I first he and I first talked about it in the fall of 2018, I think, um, and we just again slow process more because he had a big schedule of books he was putting out. Um, but it also took me a long time to select stories and a long, a really long time to write all those author's notes. And uh, then, you know, the, the, um, the proofs came out. And as anyone will see who actually looks inside here, there are a lot of stories here with some really persnickety formatting. And um, it, 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 it drives editors crazy. And I've driven, you know, like six or seven editors crazy with the kind of formatting that I've had in these stories anyway. So that had these major revisions, but also I'm sure this has happened to you, right? Um, you get to the proofs and you say, you know, the story itself needs fixing at this point. <laughs> and so I was, I was correcting my grammar. I was correcting my punctuation. I was saying that that's the wrong word to use there. You know, so it took. Did you do a TH white where you really radically changed something? Not, no, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing that big. I've heard a story that uh, Chip Delaney told once, or maybe it's actually written in one of his books. I can't remember where he actually went around to all the bookstores in New York, like the day his, a book of his came out and inserted revised pages into every copy he could find. <laughs> it might be apocryphal, but I think it actually happened. <laughs> I, I have a tendency to fall in love with my stories when they hit an end point. And uh, I sell them. I've been very excited recently when I've actually matured enough to actually revise meaningfully old work. It's a uh, new muscle for me. <laughs> so we are at, um, we are at um, 8.23. Indeed. So, so um, I'm going to start I, reading some. I, well, I would like to introduce this a little okay. bit. Okay. Just by saying that this was one of those stories, like we've talked about the revision process, and I remember when I first read this and I just thought, I, I love this. This is, this is just such a, Perfect, wonderful story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love what you do with this. So yeah, this is uh, award nominated for good reason. This is my award nominated <laughs> story. Um, and it's about, hmm, it's roughly halfway through the, oh wait, yeah. About, it's roughly uh, halfway through the anthology. Uh, it's not all that long. Um, it's called, it's a very long name. It's called um, Selected Program Notes from the Retrospective Exhibition of Teresa Rosenberg Latimer. And I'll say some things about it after we're done. So, item one, three women, 1978. Oil on canvas, 30 by 40 inches, 
Detroit Institute of Art, Detroit, Michigan. Latimer painted three women while still a student at the Rhode Island School of Design. It is the earliest completed painting that displays the hyper-realism characterizing the first period of her work. Three young women sit close together on a park bench in autumn. Two hold hands while the third has her hand on the knee of the center figure. Their expressions are serious, almost stern, as if they resent the artist's presumption in portraying them. At this stage of her career, Latimer was still experimenting with issues of compositional balance. The brightness of the orange trees offsets the dour colors of the model's clothes. The tilt of the model's heads and the orientation of their legs impel the viewer to look at the trees rather than at them. It is as if the viewer is being pushed away from people and towards nature. None of these models appears in any of Latimer's later work. Presumably, they were fellow RISD students. Latimer herself appears in the early works of others who were at RISD at that time, including A.C. Stahl and J.J. Kramer. Discussion questions. A. Use the magnifying lens provided to examine the hairs on the model's arms, the loose fibers in their sweaters, and the veins in the leaves. Many details in a Latimer painting are not visible to those who view the work at ordinary distances. Why do you think she inserted such typically invisible minutiae? What effect do they have in your experience of the painting? Item 19, self-portrait with surrogates, 1984. Oil on canvas, 51 by 77 and a quarter inches, Rhode Island School of Design Museum. Providence, Rhode Island. The first of Latimer's paintings to draw critical attention, Self-Portrait with Surrogates portrays the notorious child abuse and murder case of the Wilson family, which dominated the Rhode Island news media at the time. Seven-year-old Lisa Wilson, clad only in underwear and displaying both old scars and fresh cuts, is being beaten with an electrical extension cord wielded by her father while her mother holds her in place. None of the figures displays any emotion. It is as if they are spectators at the event. The details, again in the hyper-realist style, closely match those of the Wilson case. The family home is accurately uh, depicted, and the scars on Lisa Wilson's body correspond with photographs in the court file. Discussion questions. A. The composition and live-action flavor of this work resemble 18th and 19th century patriotic or polemical depictions of battles and famous events. David's The Death of Socrates, 1787, figure 5, is a clear influence. Why does Latimer employ such devices in a portrayal of domestic violence? Does it alter your perception of what you are really seeing? B. Some biographers associate the painting's title with the emotional and physical abuse Latimer herself experienced as a child. Is there anything in the picture itself to show that this is really a self-portrait? C. Does the fact that Latimer's parents were living when she painted this work alter the way you perceive it? Item 34. Magda number 4, 1989. Oil on poplar wood, 30 by 21 inches, private collection. Sometimes called devotion by critics, this nude is the earliest extant work featuring Magda Ridley Majeros, 1963 to 2023, Latimer's favorite model and later her wife. The lushness of the flesh and the rosiness of the skin are reminiscent of Renoir's paintings of Aline Charigot, C.E.G. The Large Bathers, 1887, figure eight. Latimer maintains microscopic hyperrealism even as she employs radiating brush strokes which emanate from the model as if Majaros is the source of reality itself. Discussion questions. A. The materials and dimensions of this painting duplicate those of da Vinci's La Gioconda, circa 1503 to 1519, figure 17. Is this merely a compositional joke or homage by Latimer? How does it change the way you see the painting? B. Most biographers agree that Latimer and Najaros were already lovers by the time this work was completed. Is this apparent from the composition or technique, from the pose of the model? 
As you proceed through the exhibit, note similarities and differences between this and other portrayals of Majaros over the next 34 years. Item 48, Conjuring, 1993. Acrylic on Masonite, 48 by 96 inches, private collection. Her largest composition and only known landscape, Conjuring appeared during a fallow period in Latimer's work. In 1992 and 1993, she completed only three paintings. The scene is an overcast day in a valley in northern New Hampshire. Although it is summer, the foliage on the hills contains much gray and purple, conveying a wintry feel. While Latimer renders exacting details in rocks, trees, even blades of grass, in this work she also employs a forced monotony in the brushwork. The shape of every stroke is practically identical to every other. In the precise center of the composition, wearing baggy khaki clothing, Magda Risley Majeros walks along an empty dirt road, recognizable only a under a magnifying lens. She does not appear to be aware of the artist. Discussion questions. A. The aforementioned slack period in Latimer's work coincided with several crises in her life, her only interval of estrangement from Magda Majeros precipitated by parental opposition to their relationship, the death by drug overdose of her close friend, the singer Pamela Enoch, uh, 1965 to 1993, and Latimer's own life-threatening illness. Her hyperrealist period ends with this painting. Can we see these life crises in the composition? Is there any hint of Latimer's coming change in style? Item 49. Performance, 1994. Acrylic on canvas, 32 by 41 inches. National Portrait Gallery, Washington, D.C. Generally regarded as one of the outstanding memorial portraits of the 20th century, performance is also the first painting of Latimer's highlight period, which occupied the rest of her career. Latimer was fascinated by the restoration of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, uh, 1980 through 1994, which sharply enhanced the clarity and brightness of Michelangelo's colors. Although some still doubt whether the restoration reflected the artist's intentions, Latimer was most interested in the side-by-side -side contrast between the pre- and post-restoration appearance of the frescoes, see the before and after pictures of the creation of Adam, figures 11 and 12. In one of her diaries, she wrote, quote, They stripped away the hurts and filth of five centuries and released the purity within. It's like looking at one of those platonic forms. Beneath the battered, mundane person, the person we see in everyday life is the true person, the soul maybe, or the heart. Of course, it looks less real to us. We're so used to the violence and degradation imposed on us by the world that we're unprepared for ourselves without it. How did I miss this before? Maybe I wasn't ready till now to understand it, but after what happened, what's still happening, this is the perfect tool, maybe the only tool." End quote. After 1994, all of Latimer's painting feature one or more highlight figures, people in the painting whose coloration has the clarity and brightness of the restored Sistine Chapel frescoes as contrasted with the duller, more commonplace tones of everything else in the composition. They seem out of place and fantastical, even cartoonish, and yet Latimer employed the same level of microscopic detail in her highlight figures as to their surroundings. The first critics who saw performance misunderstood Latimer's introduction of highlight figures because the painting is set on the stage of the Providence Performing Arts Center, and the central figure is the artist's recently deceased friend, the singer Pamela Enoch. Because she appears on the stage as if she were performing a concert, Enoch's heightened colors were taken at the time to represent the effect of theatrical spotlights. Arthur Mallory's, view, uh, uh, Arthur Mallory's review called the lighting sentimental in an otherwise naturalistic work, noting that true spotlights would have enhanced the colors of the surrounding stage as well. Magda Majeros is visible in the front row, the only member of the audience. She is turned in her seat to face the artist. Majeros is not portrayed as a highlight figure, but in the same comparatively muted tones as the theater. Discussion questions. A. As you view the many highlight figures in the remaining paintings in this exhibit, 
Consider whether these figures seem more or less real to you than those painted in ordinary colors. Why? B. Critics and biographers have puzzled over Latimer's words, what happened, what's still happening, which seem to refer to the, to the event or events that inspired or impelled her to adopt the highlight style. But what events were they, and how did they lead to this change? C. Not until 2025 did Latimer paint Magda Rizli Majaros as a highlight figure. Usually she appears in ordinary tones, as here. Why is this so? D. Why does Majaros wear a puzzled expression? Item 59. Critique. 1997. Acrylic on canvas, 44 by 67 inches, Davison Arts Center, Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Latimer painted this piece to commemorate the addition of her self-portrait with surrogates, item 19, to the permanent collection of the RISD Museum. The setting is the contemporary artist gallery of the museum. Self-portrait with surrogates hangs at the center of the composition with adjacent works also visible, notably Intelligentsia in 1986 by her friend and classmate J.J. Kramer. In the foreground is the child Lisa Wilson, the subject of Self-Portrait with Surrogates, painted as a highlight figure. The young girl is presented as if she were a critical viewer of Self-Portrait with Surrogates. She is turned three quarters toward the, art, toward the artist, but her left hand is raised toward the painting in a dismissive gesture. Her face is wry and full of humor. She appears to like the artist, even if she does not think much of the painting. Discussion questions. A. How do you interpret Lisa Wilson's apparent attitude toward Latimer's earlier painting? Is Latimer ridiculing her own work? B. Why is Lisa Wilson portrayed as younger than she was in Self-Portrait with Surrogates? Why without visible evidence of abuse? What is the significance of the party dress she wears? Item 60. Excerpt from The Silent Voices, 1997, video recording 23 minutes by permission of WGBH Television and the Public Broadcasting Service. While working on critique, Latimer was one of the subjects of Elijah Baptista's uh, video documentary concerning contemporary artists, The Silent Voices. In the excerpts shown here, she stands in the contemporary artist gallery making preliminary drawings. Oddly, she is not sketching the gallery or the paintings in the wall, but detailing the face of Lisa Wilson herself. Although there are no photographs or prior sketches evident, apart from self-portraits with surrogates, the drawing is precise, showing the same wry expression that will appear in the finished work. Discussion questions. Now that you see Latimer's manner of speaking and moving, are you surprised? Does she seem like the sort of person who would produce this sort of work? B. At the end of the excerpt, Baptista asks Latimer why she needed to come to the museum in order to, to ske uh, sketch a study of Wilson's face. Latimer's answer is, you have to paint what you see, not what you think you're supposed to see. This admonition is a commonplace among visual artists. What does it mean when uttered by someone who paints with such obvious imagination? 72. Grace. 2001. Acrylic on canvas, 20 by 60 inches, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, North Adams, Massachusetts. One of several pieces recounting Latimer's difficult relationship with her parents, Grace portrays a Thanksgiving dinner in their home. Her father, Mason Latimer, 1930 to 2008, poses as if saying grace before the meal. But both he and his wife, Sheila Rosenberg, 1935 to 2014, are staring scornfully at Teresa Rosenberg Latimer and Magda Rujli Mazeros, who sit at the opposite end of the table looking down at their plates. Standing behind the artist and Mazeros, apparently observed by no one, is Pamela Enoch, the subject of performance, item number 49, the only highlight figure in the composition. Smiling, she holds her palms above the heads of her two friends, as in benediction. Discussion questions. 
Critics have noted references in this painting to both Rockwell's Freedom from Want, 1943, figure 18, and Dali's Sacrament of the Last Supper, 1955, figure 19. What is the point of quoting such wildly disparate pieces here? Is this a parody? 20, uh, B. Pamela Enoch appears in many of Latimer's works after 1994, always a highlight figure in her mid-twenties, dressed for a performance. Why repeat the same person so often, and why always in the same clothes? Is Enoch a symbolic figure? Item 91. The Mourners, 2008. Acrylic on canvas, 20 by 30 inches, American Labor Museum, Haladon, New Jersey. The setting is a parking lot in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, that stands in the location of the 1908 Algiers Mill Fire, in which 34 workers were killed. Two distinct groups of highlight figures appear. Near the center stand the Alger brothers, the mill owners whose negligence was uh, generally blamed for the deaths, although none were ever prosecuted. They bow their heads and clasp their hands before them. Standing in a circle around them are 25 victims of the fire, their own sorrowful gazes fixed on the Alger brothers. All are dressed as they would have been in the late 19th or early 20th centuries. Here, as elsewhere, Latimer has been praised for the quality of her research. Although historians have authenticated the faces of most of the fire victims, many of the relevant photographs have taken years or even decades to find. Discussion questions. Most of the figures in this painting are younger than they were at the time of the 1908 fire. Tara Aquino, in her assiduous tally of Latimer's subjects, 2038, has calculated that 84 of the highlight figures are in their 20s and 30s, and the rest are mostly children. By contrast, Latimer's non-highlighted figures show an ordinary spread of ages. Why does Latimer make this age distinction between highlight and ordinary figures? Why not portray people as they were at the time of the relevant events? B. One of the striking things about this painting is the victims appear to be mourning for those who were responsible for their deaths. What is Latimer's message here? C. Young Lisa Wilson, a recurring figure in Latimer's work, is visible at the far right of the composition, gesturing towards the group of mourning figures. Why include a contemporary figure in an otherwise period group? Is there a connection between this painting and the others in which she appears? Item 117, self-portrait with family, 2015, acrylic on canvas, 36 by 45 inches, private collection. The setting is Latimer's own bedroom, recognizable from the furniture and memorabilia. Latimer, at her then current age of 56, crouches in the bed in a nightgown, her face hidden in her hands as if in fear, sorrow, or pain. Standing by the side of the bed, glowering down at their daughter in reproach or rage are her parents, Ma M Mason Latimer and Sheila Rosenberg. They are highlight figures. Kneeling on the bed with Latimer is Magda Majeros. Both are painted in muted colors as contrasted with the highlight parents. Majeros is in a protective posture, one hand on Latimer's curved back and the other gesturing as if to repel an invader. Discussion questions. A, why does the artist paint her parents as they appeared in their 20s before her own birth? B, why are neither Majeros's fierce gaze nor her guardian hand directed toward the figures of the parents, the only other people in the composition, but at a point beyond the right border of the picture? C. This work was composed in the year following Sheila Rosenberg's death from brain cancer, which was also the year which Latimer and Majeros finally married. How many uses of the word family are implied by the title? Item 131, to interfere for good in human matters, 2018, acrylic on canvas, 30 by 60 inches, F. Cooley Memorial Art Gallery, Reed College, Portland, Oregon. The scene is a crowded street in downtown Providence. A homeless woman with a young child sits on the, the doorstep of what may be a church. They are malnourished, shabbily dressed, and the woman holds out her hand as if asking for alms. 
The dozens of others on the street around her are a mix of both highlight figures and characters painted in muted colors, as are the beggar woman and her child. The composition pushes the eye of the viewer back and forth between the different groups in a sort of tennis match, from a highlight figure to one that is drawn to a muted figure, then another highlight figure, then to another muted figure, back and forth, until one has scrutinized every figure in the picture. This oscillation forces the viewer to see the contrast between these two groups. Superficially, the muted figures wear everyday clothes contemporary to 2018, while the highlight figures are clad in varying styles from the previous 150 years. More significant, however, are their differing reactions to the homeless pair. The muted figures bypass the seated beggars or approach them while looking elsewhere. A few are watching them from the corners of their eyes. The highlight figures, on the other hand, all stand motionless, each facing the mother and child, each with a look of pity or compassion on her or his face. Some reach out their hands as if to touch the pair, but none actually reach them. Discussion questions. A. As in other Latimer paintings, critics have observed references to other works, notably Courbet's Real Allegory of the Artist Studio, 1855, figure 40, and Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, circa 1504, figure 41. Again, why does Latimer quote from two such different pieces? B. Athena Talameos, 2025, has suggested that there is a racial or cultural message here. The muted figures are turning away from one of their own while the highlight figures reach out to the stranger. Are we being shown that it is easier to feel compassion for those who are far away or different? C. While her technique here earned her much praise, Latimer has been criticized for the blatantness of the message. Thomas Tawney, 2030, was particularly scornful of Latimer's unexplained use of a passage from Dickens' A Christmas Carol, 1843, as the title of the piece. Do you agree with Tawny? Item 146, Almost, 2022. Oil on poplar wood, 30 by 21 inches, private collection. Almost is the last portrait Latter made of Magda Rizli Majaros during the latter's lifetime. It is an unsentimental portrayal, detailing the damage done by both breast cancer and chemotherapy with all the hyper-realist accuracy at Latimer's command. From her favorite chair, Majeros gazes quietly at the artist. One detects neither fear, defiance, nor even acceptance, only the affection of one life partner for another. Standing on either side of Majeros are four highlight figures, Pamela Enoch, and three other women who have not been identified. They are looking not at Majeros, but at the artist, their arms held wide. Discussion questions. The subject, size, and materials of almost are identical to those of Magda number four, item number 34, so that it is natural to compare them. Whereas the brushwork in Magda number four pointed to Majeros herself, in almost the strokes radiate from the highlight figures, even the strokes with which Majaros is painted come from them. What other differences do you see between the two works? What similarities? B. Why are the highlight figures smiling? Item 155, Comfort, 2025. Acrylic on canvas, 11 by 8.5 inches, private collection. The last known completed work of Teresa Rosenberg Latimer is Comfort, found among her personal effects after her death by medication overdose at the age of 66. It is a quadruple portrait, somewhat reminiscent of her three women, item one. The setting is the exterior of Latimer's home, although the focus is so tight that only certain abnormalities in the brickwork allow us to identify it. The four figures are Pamela Enoch, dressed for a performance, Lisa Wilson, in her party dress, Magda Majeros as a young model, and Latimer herself at 30, the beginning of her most productive period. Latimer stands slightly in the foreground, one step ahead of the others. Enoch and Wilson are to her left, Majeros to her right, as if they are ready to catch her if she falls. All four women 
are highlight figures, bright and clear with strong definitions and confident lines. They are more radiant than the highlight figures of Latimer's earlier works. Light pours from them and they drown out the colors of the bricks behind them. Enoch's, Wilson's, and Majaros's faces are fixed on Latimer, who is smiling broadly with flushed cheeks and eyes full of hope. Discussion questions. A. The title, Comfort, was suggested by Paula Tarso, executrix of Latimer's artistic estate. We do not know what Latimer herself planned to call it. Do you think the name fits? That's the end of that story. Thank you. A toast. Yeah, well, a drink for me. I'm a throat strike. <laughs> oh, hi, Karen. Ah. So I've never read that all the way through out loud before. Um, it um, After it came out, it appeared on... Um, Oops, I'm sorry. I was off mic. I was, you didn't hear my clapping. No, we saw it. Clapping. We saw oh, you your saw clapping. We, know you, we knew you were clapping. I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was saying that um, that was not the hardest of the stories to lay out in the book. No, but, <laughs> but it wasn't easy either. Yeah. No, it, it was a lot, there were a lot of formatting things uh, yeah. in there. But um, uh, uh, after, after it was published, it came out uh, again in, um, in Podcastle and uh, – and, uh, uh, Peter, um, oh, I'm trying to blank at his last name. Anyway, um, it was it was read uh, uh, on uh, on uh, on Podcastle, and uh, oh hi Alex, hi James, um, and um, he did a very he did an extraordinary job uh, on it, and um, uh, so uh, so many of my I, I'm very very fond of podcasts, and and so many of my stories have been read. Um, uh, by really wonderful um, narrators that I'm, nowadays I'm a little bit leery to um, read them out loud myself. At my KGB reading uh, last month uh, with Nora Jamison, I read the first story in this collection, which is uh, Plausibility of Drag. Uh, no, excuse me. The, the first is Some Pebbles in the Palm. And the thing about Some Pebbles in the Palm is that when it was podcast, it was narrated by Stefan Rudnicki, who was like the greatest audiobook reader in America. And so, you know, I felt woefully inadequate, you know, to, to, be, um, to be reading that out. That, that's just part of the neuroticness of being a writer. Yeah. Like woefully inadequate. <laughs> yeah. It was great. And I think um, uh, one of the things that I, I, I love about what you bring to fiction, I think um, I was wondering the other day whether it was um, some of your experience with acting and stuff like that. Um, often when somebody has such a feel for the poetry of the line and the spaces in between, I think, huh, like how much do they read poetry and love poetry? And I was thinking about asking you about poetry and then I was like, but I wonder how much of that is also like you understand um, the active role that the actor can play in terms mm. of having a relationship with your, the text. And then your, the blog post came out in whatever, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, interview where you talk about that, like the politics of wanting people to be actively engaged mm. with the text. So, um, the, uh, yeah, the, um, what's it, to answer that question, the question about how does the theater background affect the writing? The answer is the dialogue. Um, you, you do enough acting, you, ju you just get a little bit of an ear for what sounds like naturalistic dialogue and what doesn't. And so it's very, for me, dialogue is the easiest thing to write way by far um, because it's easy for me to hear it in my head. I'm actually working on a story right now that is actually nothing but dialogue. Oh, nice. About 5,000 words of dialogue. Um, I mean, it's got a few, it's got, it's got attribution notes and one or two stage directions like, you know, um, they listen silently or something like that. But, but um, for the most part, um, it's just dialogue. In fact, it, when you read it, it looks like a play. It's not a play. It's supposed to be read as a story, but, but, um, but it, uh, it looks like one. Are you, are you tempted to write plays? I have tried. Um, and uh, to date, I don't think I've done very well at it. I think um, it's, it's a, 
this this story is the first that I'm working on now is the first time I've ever really tried to work with dialogue alone. And you, you know, what do you got as 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 a writer? You got like four tools, right? You got exposition, you got description, you got action, you got dialogue, and that's it. And um, you do a play. You got no exposition. <laughs> you got no description, except in, you know if you want to describe the set, uh, and 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 the actions. You have actions, but but not very, but not very many of them. Um, I read uh, a few years ago. I read the opening of uh, August Wilson's play Fences, and the opening description of the set is actually a very long historical uh, summary of the history of African Americans in the United States, right? Now, it's really interesting that he puts that into the opening description because no member of the audience is going to see that, right? But it's so essential that everyone working on the play... Yeah, that's right. That. I think I think, I think, what he wanted was for the directors and actors to have that in their heads when they... and, and the designers when they, when, they, when, they, when they did that. Very, very instructive. So... Um, so if your sense of visual uh, poetry and the spaces like in between, like I love in, in comics and with your, yeah. um, your form, uh, your form stories. And um, I love like le letters of observation, which is one of the yeah. stories. It just, like, I, I, I love that story so much. It's a, uh, um, the sense the the, the the world that you, that gets built through these mm -hmm. poems is uh, incredible. Um, so, if, so if, if my theory about plays and acting is wrong, like where where did you get that that kind of poetry, and how do you cultivate that? You call it poetry. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. About the spaces in between. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I do a little bit of painting myself and drawing, and I think a lot about negative space. Um, but. Um, Well, I have a couple of theory. I haven't thought about this. I have a couple, I, I, but I, I have a couple of theories. All right. So theory number one is that, as I say in that essay you were talking about, I'm 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 really interested in forcing the reader to take responsibility for the text, and so when you leave things out on purpose and you force the reader to bridge the gap between the two things, the reader can't help but know I'm doing this. The writer didn't do this. I'm doing this. And so it, inc it inculcates, it, 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 um, it implicates, it makes the reader part of, 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 of what's happening. So I, I like that negative spacing a lot. The other thing is, um, so I know you know, probably some of my readers don't, um, viewers don't, is that uh, the two years prior to my starting to write serious, I mean, professional fiction, I did a lot of writing of fan fiction. And the thing that I loved about fan fiction was its economy. Because since you could count on every one of your readers to be someone who had read the same source text that you had, you could say in like three words something that would to all of them call up, you know, an entire you know, five, six, seven, ten paragraphs, right? And so you could and you could so you could use that as like ammunition, right? You drop you drop one word. You so know your shared vocabulary. Right, exactly. Um, and that's a great luxury, once which, which I missed a lot when I stopped writing fan fiction, right? I missed uh, I, mean, I mean, in a sense, it makes you kind of lazy, right? Because it means you 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 don't have to do do the work of describing things uh, for people because they'll already know. Um, but again, it's this business of what falls between, right? What am I not telling the reader? Because in the case of fan fiction, the reader doesn't have to be told, right? Or in the case of these other stories, because I want them to 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 generate it themselves. I guess. Yeah, and, and and it's really interesting. Like the world of cultivating shared vocabulary. I mean, a lot of the you know great works and the classics, you know, were about that kind of establishing. You know, you say Minotaur, it it, it evokes for something. 
And uh, indeed, uh, my mentor James Boyd White maintained that the uh, the uh, the Iliad is really about a break a breakdown of shared vocabulary. That what it's really about is a place where the characters become unable to talk to each other. That this word honor um, takes on a meaning for Achilles that it no longer takes on for anybody else in the story. And the conflict derives from the fact that they can't get through to each other anymore, right? That they all agree honor is important, but they no longer agree what it is. Oh, you know? wow. Yeah, that's one way of looking at the Iliad. Well, and it certainly showed like a, a change of like, <laughs> what lies are acceptable? What is the honor in war? And, you mm -hmm. know, um, that's really cool. I studied the Iliad and I never came across that. I really, I really like it. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna quickly see how we are for time. Um, and, for, and for questions, have I mean, they posed any questions that uh, that you could ask for them? I do, because, um, if not, because we could go to, go to another story. We, we could indeed. Um, yeah, I don't think we've got any particular questions. We've got, uh, yeah, James Van Pelt. Uh, he says, an influential poet uh, for me, Lou Welch, started all his discussions on writing with a statement, the basic tool is speech. It's clear that you are sympathetic. Oh, yeah, for sure I am uh, with that. And the Iliad was a spoken poem. And uh, word. and I think there is a beauty about, um, uh, like I hadn't thought about it before, but Rudy Rucker is passionate about painting as well, mm. reading these things. And if he gets stuck on a story, he will like do paintings and stuff like that. And there is, I, I think about composition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When I well, when I look at paintings, um, because again, I paint a little bit, um, I just get consumed with how did that? How did they do that? Right. I'm especially. I could spend forever looking at paintings that have water in them, rivers or lakes or ponds, because every artist has a different take on how you convey water how you convey bodies of water. And it just blows my mind, you know, all the different ways they do it. <laughs> what is hot? Uh, so yeah, we should uh... go to another, go to another, uh, if, you, if there aren't more, more questions at this point, then I can go, go to another story. And what I think I'll do is I'll read part of a story. Um, you gonna say something? Uh, no, I think we've, we've got to all the questions and okay. some other folks are joining us in drinking. So. Okay, uh, the more drinking, the better. Um, so um, the thing about uh, selected program notes is that it's still available for free online. Uh, this story is not. This story uh, coming up, you either have to buy the appropriate issue of Analog or you have to buy this book uh, to be able to... Um, to be able to uh, get it, so I'm not going to read the whole story. But I mean, this it's actually it, it's a it's actually it's a novelette. It's the longest work in the collection. But I'm only going to read the first three scenes, um, and uh, I think you'll understand uh, what's going on in the in the uh, in the, the story from the or at least what's starting to go on in these first three scenes. So this is called. Um, Keepsakes. It was originally uh, published in Analog uh, Science Fiction and Fact at the end of 2017. Uh, oh, I should mention that the previous story we did, Select the Program Notes, was originally published in Clockwork Phoenix 4 in uh, 2013. So, uh, but Keepsakes was published in Analog in 2017. Uh, and here are the first three scenes, which won't take very long. As usual, the simulation shows Doru's keepsake sitting on the scuffed leather couch in his apartment on Medway Street, barefoot, wearing those wonderful soft jeans and the pink shirt that eventually fell apart. Doru sits across from it in the real, real wicker chair in his current condo. The keepsakes, the keepsake's unlined face really rather good looking, even with the hint of residual baby fat, gazes at Doru with calm tolerance. Tell me about dinner with Afzal at the Rue, says Doru. The keepsake rolls its eyes. Again? You mean the last time we went? Not say the other 10 or 15 times? Doru nods. Unless you remember those as well as you remember that one. 
the keepsake flutters the first two fingers of its right hand. You know I don't. All right. Afzal met me on Hope Street after he finished work. How did he get there? The keepsake sighs. He walked up the long hill from downtown, and his face was pink and a little shiny, and he was breathing hard. Doru inhales happily. What was he wearing? That silly suede jacket and his tall boots. It wasn't silly, says Doru. The keepsake assumes a look of mock astonishment. Oh, that's interesting. Would you like to tell me about it? How that feels? How you feel? That'd be something. Doru shakes his head. Didn't think so, said the keepsake. Just tell me, says Doru. Did you kiss him? The keepsake shrugs. Of course. What did he smell like? Almonds. That shampoo he had. Yes. Doru sighs. Then what? We walked down Hope Street from the middle of College Hill. It was a cool, breezy day, and Afzal's hand felt pleasantly hot by contrast. Hmm. The trees had a lot of yellow and red in them. In the slanting sunlight, their contrast against the darkening blue sky was blinding. Yes. We noticed that there were some new playground toys at Fox Point. We started talking about children. Afzal still didn't want them. Don't tell me that part, says Doru. The keepsake gives them an exasperated look. Would you like to give me a script? Exactly what I can say and what I can't? Doru doesn't answer. We spent half that meal talking about whether to have kids. You want me to guess at which aspects of that conversation you don't want to hear? You should know me well enough. No, the keepsake interrupts. You should know me well enough. I have no basis at all for knowing you. You never tell me anything. You wouldn't learn anything from it anyway, says Doru. Depends on what you mean by learn, says the keepsake. Again, Doru doesn't reply. Oh, I can tell some things by inspection. You've become a maudlin old man. Fifty isn't old, says Doru. Well, obviously you thought so once, didn't you, says the keepsake, gesturing with its fingertips at its own chest. A maudlin old man who likes to spend his time daydreaming about the past. God, your life must be dull. Doru stares at the keepsake for several seconds. Then, more quietly, he says, Look, can it hurt you to tell me the things I ask? You remember them so clearly. I just want to be reminded. But only the good things. Doru nods. The keepsake shrugs again. No, of course it can't hurt me. Nothing can hurt me, can it? All right. We drank a dark Spanish wine. Afsal had that huge salad niçoise they do so well. I had the lamb, which was just as fine as ever. Doru spends another 20 minutes listening to this beautiful story before he closes the simulation and goes to bed. As usual, Afzal's keepsake is sitting in a bare room, the single window allowing pale light from an overcast sky to give him a slightly bluish hue. Afzal stands behind another chair, leaning on it, looking into the keepsake's eyes. Good evening says Afzal. I thought I'd fill you in uh, on recent events. The keepsake nods, its face apprehensive but resigned. Sue granted our motion for summary judgment, says Afzal. Those affidavits did the trick, and those discovery responses too. Never laid eyes on a single document that could help them. They'll appeal, says the keepsake. Ah, of course they'll appeal. But no genuine issue of material fact means no genuine issue of material fact. They'll have nothing to stand on. The keepsake sighs. Congratulations. So multi-million dollar company one successfully avoids liability to multi-million billion dollar company two because of the cleverness and guile of its brilliant lawyers. Especially one of its brilliant lawyers. I'm thrilled. Afzal wags a finger. Truthfulness now, you're disappointed. The keepsake looks him in the eyes. Yes, I'm disappointed. 
Afzal inhales through his nostrils as if exploring the bouquet of a lovely old wine. Oh, tell me why. You know why. Afzal winks. Tell me anyway. Like a witness under oath, its eyes on the opposite wall, the keepsake begins. You have no idealism. You work for people you can't, you don't care about. You glory over victories that prove nothing but your own skill. Afzal nods. Yes, indeed. I've grown up quite a bit. You call it growing up. And you call it? Stelling out, of course. Afzal grins. Oh, say it again. Why? You know why. Selling out. Afzal purses his lips. You don't seem very upset, though. Why aren't you more upset? The keepsake grimaces. What is there to be upset about? There's nothing here you haven't told me before. So the disappointing failure has one more disappointing failure. So this winter is just as cold and gray as the last. No news at all. Afzal taps the back of the chair. Sounds like a negotiating tactic to me. You ought to know. What the hell do I have to negotiate for? Afzal considers. You'd like me to stop doing this. It's painful. If you can make me think that it's not having any effect, maybe I'll lose interest and find some other way to entertain myself. Very clever. The keepsake shakes its head. You have an amazingly high opinion of yourself and not much imagination anymore. If a news window only told you things you already knew and no one let you close it, would you get upset or just bored? Afzal thinks for a while. Well then, I'll have to find something new. For the first time, a flicker of something like fear passes over the keepsake's face. It's delicious. Eugenius never looked at her father's collection of birthday keepsakes. She remembers making them, of course. When she was a little girl, it seemed silly to walk and talk for 20 minutes, then sit for another 20 minutes wearing a stretchy cap with wires leading out of it, especially on her birthday. She was always impatient for her party and presents. But her father said that someday she'd be happy to see and hear what she was like when she was little. It never made sense to her because none of her friends did anything like this. She starts with the most recent keepsake, but it isn't very interesting. Eugenia at 19 is a lot like Eugenia at 21. They have some fun asking each other things, and the keepsake wants to hear gossip about all her friends and their girlfriends and boyfriends. Eventually, Eugenia waves goodbye to the keepsake, who waves merrily back. Then she calls herself up at 11. She remembers that as an especially good day, and the keepsake agrees that it's been a nice day so far, but the fun things, the pony ride and the juggler, haven't happened yet, although the keepsake is looking forward to them. The keepsake talks for a while about her best friends, Nancy and Jake and Serena. Eugenia hasn't thought about Serena for five years at least. She's delighted. Each time, Eugenia saves both the copy with a memory cache of their conversation and the original, which ought to be the same every time she activates it. She's not sure why, though. She can't imagine what she'd do with the keepsake that remembered being previously awakened. Surely, if you'd wanted to relive your memories, you'd want them as fresh and untrammeled as you could get them. Then Eugenia decides to interact with herself really, really young. Not the first one from her first birthday. A crawling, drooling keepsake wouldn't be much fun. Instead, she chooses the, key, the five-year-old. She can't remember anything from that, about that birthday, except that there were little horse figurines on the cake. She wonders whether she was one of those sweet, adorable kids or one of those obnoxious, whiny kids. The little girl, who appears in the center of the room, is dressed in a red tank top and red slacks that Eugenia vaguely remembers. She knows she had a real penchant for red back then. The keepsake looks around the room with mild interest, then catches sight of Eugenia. Mommy! The keepsake shrieks then runs forward as if to throw her arms around Eugenia's legs. Since the keepsake is only a simulation, her arms go right through Eugenia as if she weren't there. Mommy, mommy! The girl cries again, more desperate. Shit! 
Of course this birthday was only a few months after her mother died, and of course Eugenia looks like her mother. Stupid, stupid, stupid. The little girl is sobbing wildly, kneeling, still trying to reach Eugenia with her hands. Eugenia probably should just turn off the keepsake and try again another time, but she can't keep herself from trying to comfort the child to calm her down. Eug what was her nickname then? Jeannie. Jeannie, I'm not mommy, Jeannie. You're okay, says the keepsake through her tears. Daddy didn't hurt you. You're okay. The skin and Eugenia's back and neck tightens as if she's leaned into a block of ice. Daddy, she says. The little girl nods, sniffling. Eugenia speaks calmly, trying to get a lullaby sing-song under her voice. I'm okay, Jeannie. See, I'm fine. She spreads her arms and smiles. The keepsake takes a shuddering breath, gives a little smile of its own. Eugenia talks with it for a while longer, about simple things, pets, toys, her party. Then she asks, what did daddy do, sweetie? And that's the end of the third scene. Ooh. <laughs> now you got to go find it, everybody. Now you got to go get the book so you can. Well, you can where can, it where can you get the book? Where can you where can you get this book? Oh, look at that! Where did that just come from? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just finding all kinds of fun buttons here. Hey, first time doing this, so I'm not doing it too right. bad. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Thanks great for, story. For that this. whole thing's great. What was that, Liz? I said thank you for creating this space, Patrick. It's awesome. Yeah. And wonderful. Yeah. Was it fun to do? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, and it's actually fairly easy and with this program, with this platform and pretty intuitive actually. Okay. And I'm getting used to it, except for when I was going to keepsakes and like, oh, what's that colon doing there? Took it out, put it back on. Yeah. Oh, cause it was supposed to be a, co a close quote. Oh, uh -huh. hey, wrong story. Sorry, I was typing it in as you said, cause I wasn't sure which we were gonna read the second one. I forgot, oh God, was he gonna read keepsake? So I had to wait till you said it and then I was typing. Right, it. cause we, 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 we had talked about like th two or three different stories to yes. read. Uh, yeah. I, had, I had spoken about reading levels of observation, and Liz suggested reading part of dispersion. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was. A, I think I really wanted a story that was a lot more like a regular narrative, <laughs> um, or yeah. I mean, or as regular as I ever get. Um, <laughs> I, I think, it's, yeah, I, I love this one's kind of a, a very like. Um, uh, uh, it's got good. Um, it's a good. Uh, it, it's it's got science fiction at that wonderful like really thinking through a technological thing plus you know procedural wondering like what's going on and stuff like that. Right. Um, I almost said a little bit Asmovian, but you've got way too much characterization and stuff going. Ooh, on. zing! <laughs> um, I oh read dear. That. I read a lot of Asimov growing up, but characterization was not. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think what what. Okay, so I'm not comparing myself to anyone. All right, <laughs> but one really? of the one of the things that um, Ray Bradbury was really good at was getting you to feel how the technology felt to the people. Right, there are all these scenes in Fahrenheit 451, you know, where it just feels really lived in. And it in, in even even eerily predictive, right? There's this moment on a subway where a guy or a, a bus where a guy's on. This is 1950, right? What we would understand to be a cell phone, right? Although of course they didn't have cell phones, and he's narrating to his wife exactly where the bus is, right? I'm passing Fourth Street, honey. I'm passing Fifth Street, honey. I'm passing Sixth Street, honey. You know, and I'm going. This is just too creepily real. Right, this notion that once you've got the technology that allows you to be in touch constantly, you're going to feel compelled to use it. You're going to feel compelled to keep people informed of your moment by moment by moment lights. Anyway, so what I like about that those scenes is that I mean, they're, it's all about how the people feel, right, about this and how they're using the keepsake, right. So Doru is using it basically to reminisce, right. He's trying to he's trying to recapture his past. Afzal appears to be using it to torture it, 
right? Which and is and really for an audience, have a past self as the audience. Yeah, right. have your past. Kind of rest of yeah. being judged by your reminiscent. Right, and so I mean, he wants to be judged by his younger self. He 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 likes that it makes his younger self uncomfortable, you know, which is psychologically very strange, right? And then you've got Eugenia, who's really doing it for a lark, right? Um, just because she wants to see what it's like, and then she goes way over her head, right? In that scene, because apparently there's something she something really important that she forgot, um, and uh, and so that's the, those are the three the three characters, uh, the three major characters of the of the of the story, who of course eventually interact with each other, right? Uh, but not in these three these three scenes. These three scenes. These three scenes are are separate. And the nature the nature of memory is just mm. um, the 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 ability to visit previous selves is quite a you know every time you visit a memory you change it and it's kind of right. interesting that you can create a backup as well as something that is influenced by you reminiscing with your reminiscence. Um, is there if you could visit any past Ken self, what what past Ken self would you visit? Oh, good Lord. Um, everything I have to say about that is sentimental. <laughs> you know, I mean, I remember my past self at moments of, you know, like um, angst and despair and things like that. And I, I, would, I would just want to be the comforting hand on the shoulder saying, you're going to get over it. Don't worry about it. You know, it's, you'll get past it. Um, uh or this thing that you worry about never happening will happen, you know. Uh, this thing that you're afraid is going to happen won't happen, you know. I mean, mostly, mostly that. I mean, because I mean, that that's me as a kid or as a teenager, you know. Um, I guess the one thing I would say to me at to me at like twenty three or something like that is maybe maybe don't go to law school right at once. Maybe actually start writing. <laughs> You know. Oh, who knows all the different paths? Oh, here's a here's an awesome question that's come up from Shauna Roberts. From Shauna. Yeah, hello, Shauna. <laughs> so Ken, do you have rules for constructing scenes? As in, for example, what has to happen between the beginning and the end? Not not initially. I mean, mostly the scenes I write to start with are just whatever they are. When I start to get down to the really hard work of first of all transitional scenes and then revision, yeah, then I have things that have things that things that have to happen. Uh, I'm in a I'm in a I'm in a, uh, a, a writer study group right now with a couple of my friends, and um, we're reading a book about about novel writing, which I, I've never done, um, but it's really making me think a lot about yeah, scenes are supposed to have functions. I mean. Yeah, I'm supposed to get from here to there in a scene. Wouldn't it be nice if I maybe thought about that when I was writing? That would be, that would be intriguing. Like, I don't know. It's, not the, the, it's the perils of the pantser, I think, in a way. I don't, yeah. I've written pages and pages of notes in preparation for chatting to you and post-its, and I keep abandoning my own scripts. Keep pantsing it instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, although, I, although hey. I was, oh, yeah. I thought you were done. Go ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead. You can join I the just, conversation. No, I was just yeah. gonna say it was earlier a question from uh, from Glenn about uh, Clarion. I gave him a uh, very short pat answer, but I thought, well, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the yeah. Clarion experience um, uh, beyond sure. what my few notes were. So yeah, my uh, my this is my college classmate Glenn London um, asking uh, asking that is, uh, and uh, that that he ends with a pun is typical. Um, <laughs> But um, so the Clarion Writers Workshop uh, started. Uh, it came. It came out of the Milford uh, workshops, which was uh, some professional writers workshop of the 1960s, and um, was founded by a fellow at Clarion College in Pennsylvania, which is why it's called Clarion. And then it was picked up by um, by uh, Damon Knight and Kate Wilhelm, who ran it as a uh, uh, themselves for decades after that. It was a summer workshop. It's six weeks long. Um, takes uh, 18 journeyman level writers, really, uh, not necessarily published, 
but uh, maybe apprentice level writers, but people who know their way around a sentence, know their way around a paragraph, know their way around a character, more or less, and um, subjects them to um, six weeks of sleep deprivation. And, um, and you write a story every week and you critique all of your classmate stories every week, uh, which usually meant that we were critiquing three to four stories every night. So uh, at supposed to be dinner time, but it never was dinner time. Uh, you would uh, you'd get stories, that, actual printouts of the stories that your classmates had written, um, and then you would sit up until eleven or twelve at night, writing writing critiques. What I always did, because I I always needed two passes, was I wrote marginal notes between you know like six o'clock and midnight, I'd go to sleep, then I'd get up at five in the morning and I'd type my narrative comments until breakfast, you know, quickly print them out and then, and then, um, run to, uh, run to breakfast. And, uh, anyway, this, this, um, this, uh, workshop has been training professional writers for, you know, nearly 50 years. There's now two Clarions, Clarion in uh, San Diego, which were where we went, and Clarion West in Seattle, uh, which is no longer really much younger than Clarion. They're they're really the same, and they're and they're and they're of comparable uh, reputation. But usually, but there are six professional writers, uh, usually very well known professional writers, who act as the mentors for each of the six weeks. Um, ours when we were there were uh, Holly Black, uh, Larissa Lai, Robert Crace, Kim Stanley Robertson, Paul Park, and Elizabeth Hand were our, were our, six, our six mentors, our six teachers. Um, but you teach each other a lot. But a whole lot of famous people have come out of Clarion. In point of fact, um, two of our teachers, Bob Crace and Stan Robinson, were classmates of each other at Clarion. Um, so it's, it's, a uh, quite the, quite the factory. Yeah. It creates this wonderful, intense sort of transformational experience. And because you're on such a deadline, it gives you permission to experiment wildly. I think we had such different tastes in instructors. I know my stories would be directly shaped by whoever we'd had the week before. Yes. Which often the next instructor wasn't a fan of that. <laughs> I gave a Robert Crace like space station, space bounty story to Kim Stanley Robinson. He's like, what? So yeah. What was your wildest experiment at Clarion? Oh, my wildest experiment. Yeah. Uh, apart from the one that failed. <laughs> you can include failure. Failure is important. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't know if you remember this because I, I haven't. Remember. It, it, it hasn't seen the light of day since Clarion. I, was, I wrote this. I wrote this story called "The Knight's Grove," which was this bizarre uh, uh, story about a knight with a knight apprentice, and there was child abuse, and there were these talking trees, um, and it was it sucked. It was uh, it was it was really terrible. Um, and uh, I have not ever done anything with it since. But uh, I guess the second biggest experiment was, ten was tenure track, which of course appears in this collection. Um, where it, was so good. it was so good straight out of the gate. Do you remember Liz sitting at the breakfast table and my asking, tell me all the different forms you can think of, right? I asked, I asked people to brainstorm f types of different forms like forms that you would fill out and you would say, why? It's for a story. Never mind. Just tell me all the forms you can think of. Right. And so, you know, I was just, people just thought, gave me all these forms. And I just, I wrote this, um, I wrote the story based on that. Oh, I mean, God. yeah. I'd forgotten until now that you'd asked for the brainstorming, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. So it's like we're down to, whoa, my, it just switched to a minute. So, huh. Uh, it left in our broadcast here. So I, I did a last question. Yeah, go for it. Off one, I just... one thing that I was you, you touched on fan fiction a little bit, and mm -hmm. I learned so much about fan fiction from you guys at Clarion. Um, that was my real introduction to the beauty of the form and the intense thinking that can go into the form. Um, seeing you tear up talking about a particular Harry Potter fanfic, I really treasure. Um, 
and one of the things I learned at Clarion from Dana was um, like the feedback cycle for fanfic is incredibly fast. Like you, oh, produce, yeah. you produce, you get an audience, folks yum sure. it up. Um, yeah. And then like trad publishing is just like a complete, like it is the other, how did you adjust to that very different feedback cycle, very different reward kind of? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, you have to, you really have to be into it for the, for the love of the, of, of the process. Um, I mean, I was never that much into the feedback. It was lovely to get. And I'll tell you, um, the best thing anybody ever said about one of my stories ever was about a, about, about a fanfic I wrote. Somebody, somebody posted, um, you have no way of knowing this, but I was in a very, very bad place and I was despairing and I was even thinking about self-harm and this story pulled me out. And I said to myself, I'm done. I'll never have to write another word again. I have done everything I could ever. And this is before I ever, I ever published anything professionally, right? I mean, a fanfic, you know, did what everything, everything a story is supposed to do. Go figure. That's beautiful. Yeah. And now look where you are. Yeah. With headphones on, talking to Liz. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, a collection out. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great, wonderful, well-received re stories. So. So thank you, Ken and Liz. Let's applaud each other. You don't have to applaud me, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Applaud you. Oh, and our audience, thank you. Yeah, thank you, audience. Taking on an extra few minutes. Uh, Ken and Liz will pop on to hang on for just a sec after. Mm -hmm. We certainly and, will. Uh, any, uh, anything last to say before we, we're a little over? Uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for coming. And I wanted to... Uh, uh, I mean, I've just, I've had a lot of support from all my friends and from some people who are just total strangers over this collection and over the stories over the years. And I just wanted to say thank you. It's been, it's been, it's been very gratifying to have so much affection from people. Well earned affection. You are such a good egg, Ken. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so go buy it's a good egg. Good egg. Food for the soul. Yes. Go buy it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.